I'll take this opportunity to introduce another friend and longtime colleague, a fellow I met when he was just a scrawny little boy at Harvard, actually Radcliffe, and he came walking into the AI lab with a box of cards underneath his arm. A box of cards was a list interpreter in the PT11 site that Tyrek got. Well, actually, there are two guys out here. One was named Guy Steele, and then the other was named Richard Stolz. Richard has worked with LISP, for LISP, against LISP, around LISP, and more recently, we've seen him in the vein of uh, GNU. Uh, GNU is not unique, it's free software, the League for Programming Freedom, and patent issues. I kind of wish he were going to talk about patents today, but he promises me he's going to talk about LISP, although he doesn't know what he's going to talk about. Hey, that sounds like a man in our community. Richard Solomon, RMS.
but I think that it's the nature of the way we lived at the AI lab that led to Emacs and made it what it was. The original Emacs did not have Lisp in it. The lower level language, the non-interpreting language was PDP 10 assembler. And what the interpreter we wrote in that actually wasn't written for Emacs. It existed for years. It was called Tico. It was our text editor. It was an extremely ugly programming language, as ugly as could possibly be. And the reason is it wasn't designed to be a programming language. It was designed to be an editor command language. So there were commands like 5L, meaning move down five lines, or I and then a string and then escape to insert that string. And so you could type a string, a series of commands, which was called a command string. And you'd end it with escape escape, and then it would get executed and your screen would update. <clears throat> well, people wanted to extend this language with programming facilities, so they added some. For instance, uh, one of the first ones he added was a looping construct, which was less than, greater than. So you put those around things and it would loop. And there were other cryptic commands that you could use to conditionally exit the loop. And to make Emacs, we added facilities to have subroutines with names. Before that, it was sort of like basic, and the subroutines could only have single letters as their names. But that was hard to program, hard to program with. So we had to be really to have longer names. And actually, some rather sophisticated facilities. I think that Lisp got its unwind protect facility from Tico. Well, what? Yeah, the thing is that I think Unwind Protect was in Tico before it was in Mac. It's true, but maybe you know, having some way to catch all conditions and do things may have existed in Multix. I don't actually know. So we started putting in rather sophisticated facilities all with the ugliest syntax you could ever manage to think of. And it worked anyway. If people were able to write large programs in it anyway. But the obvious lesson was that a language like Tico, which wasn't designed to be a programming language, which was designed for something else instead, was the wrong way to go. That the language that you build your extensions on shouldn't be thought of as programming as an afterthought. It should be designed as a programming language. And in fact, we discovered the best language for that purpose was Lisp. It was Bernie Greenberg who discovered that. He wrote a version of Emacs in Multics Maplet. Now in this case, he already had written Multics Maplet, and he wrote his editing commands in Maplet in a straightforward fashion. So the editor itself was written entirely in Lisp. Multics Maplet proved to be a great success. And it was and programming new editing commands was so convenient that even the secretaries in his office started learning to do it. The reason was someone wrote a manual for how to extend Multics Emacs, and he didn't say this was programming. And so those secretaries were reasonably intelligent, but believed they could never learn programming, were not scared off. They read the manual, they discovered they could extend Emacs and they could do useful things. So they did it. They learned to program because they didn't know that what they were learning was programming. So we saw that a, an application, a program that does something useful for you, <coughs> which has Lisp inside it and which you can extend by rewriting the Lisp programs, is actually a very good way for people to learn programming. It gives them a chance to write small programs that are actually useful for them, which in most arenas you can't possibly do. So they can get encouragement from their own practical use 
at the stage where things are hardest, where they don't believe they can program until they get to the point where they are programmed. So at that point, people began wondering, how can we have something like this on a platform where we don't already have a uh, full service list implementation? Well, the CMAX, after all, had a compiler as well as an interpreter. It was a full-fledged list system. But people wanted to implement something like that on other systems where they had not already with a powerful list with a compiler. Well, if you didn't have a list compiler, you couldn't write the whole editor in list. It would be too slow. Especially redisplay, would, for instance, would be too slow if you if it had to write an interpreted list. So we developed a hybrid technique that I think was developed in a discussion between me and somebody who worked at the architecture machine group, whose name I don't remember anymore, who went ahead and implemented a, an Emacs for, I think it was uh, Intermetrics machines. No, that was not Emacs. My memory is lost in history. That was in the 1970s. Uh, the idea was to write parts to write a Lisp interpreter and the lower level parts of the editor together so that parts of the editor were primitive Lisp facilities, in effect. And those would be whichever parts you felt you had to optimize. This was a technique that we already consciously practiced in the original Emacs because there were certain fairly high level features which we re-implemented in machine language to make them into TICO primitives. For instance, there was a TICO primitive to do to fill a paragraph or do most of the work of filling a paragraph because some of the less time consuming parts of the job could be done at the higher level by writing a TICO program. And you could do the whole job by writing a TICO program, but that was too slow. So we optimized it by putting part of it into machine language. This, that's the same idea here, that most of your editor would just be written in Lisp, but certain parts of it that had to run particularly fast would get written at a lower level, and they would be Lisp primitives designed specifically for an editor. And therefore, when I wrote my second implementation of Emacs, the new Emacs, I followed that same kind of design. The low-level language was not machine language anymore, it was C. C was a good, efficient language to use for portable programs to run in a Unix-like operating system. So in C, there was a Lisp interpreter, but also facilities for specific for special purpose editing jobs, manipulating editor buffers and inserting and deleting text and reading and writing files, redisplaying the buffer on the screen, managing the editor windows are some of the jobs that were implemented directly in C. Now this was not <coughs> the first Emacs that was written in C and ran on Unix. The first was written by James Gosling, who was often referred to as Gosmax. And a strange thing happened there. At the beginning, he seemed to be influenced by the spirit of cooperation and sharing of the original Emacs. When I first released the original Emacs to people not at MIT, which was when somebody ported it to run on Twinx, because originally it only ran on the incompatible time sharing system that we used at MIT. So you know, we, there was no use distributing it, but somebody ported it to Twinx, and that meant that there were a few hundred installations around the world that could potentially use it. We started distributing it to them, and we said the rules were you had to send back your improvements so that we could all benefit. And no one ever tried to actually enforce that. It wasn't legally enforceable anyway. But as far as I know, people did cooperate with it. So Gosling did, at first, seem to participate in this spirit. 
he wrote in a manual that he called the program Emax, hoping that others in the community would improve it until it was worthy of that name. And that's the right approach to take towards the community, to ask people to join in and make the program better. But after that, he seemed to change the spirit and he sold it to a company. And at the time that I was working on the Emacs, there was no free software to Max editor that ran on Emacs. I did, however, have a friend who had participated in developing Gosling Emacs. And Gosling had given him, by email, permission to distribute his own version. And so he said, he proposed to me that I could use that. Then I discovered that Gosling's Emacs did not have a real list. It had a, a programming language that was known as mock list, which looked syntactically like list, but didn't have the data structures of list. And so programs were not data, and so the true elements of list was completely missing. Its data structures, I think, were uh, strings, numbers, and a, a a few other specialized things. So in fact, I couldn't really use it. I had to replace it all. The first step was to write an actual list interpreter. And then I gradually adapted every part of the editor based on the list data structures rather than ad hoc data structures. Making the data structures of the internals of the editor exposable and manipulable by the user's list program. The one exception was redisplay. For a long time, redisplay was sort of an alternate world. The editor would enter the world of redisplay, and things were going on with very non list like data structures that were not safe for garbage collection, not safe for interruption, and you couldn't run any list programs during that. We changed that since it's now possible to run list code for redisplay. It's a quite a convenient thing. The, this second of my Emacs's, the new Emacs, was free software in the modern sense of the term. It was developed as part of an explicit, as a part of an explicit political campaign to make software free. <clears throat> and the, the essence of this campaign is that everybody should be free to do the things that we did in the old days at MIT in working together on our software, working together with whoever wanted to work with us. That is the basis of the free software movement. The, the experience I had, the life that I lived at the MIT AI lab, to be working on human knowledge and not trying to stand in anybody's way in further using and further disseminating human knowledge. That spirit is what I had to rebuild. And why did I have to rebuild it? That too concerns the list. In the late 70s, Richard Greenblatt started designing a new kind of computer that would be that was specifically intended to run list programs fast. He took advantage of the fact that integrated circuits had reached a level where you could get, where you could design a computer that would run microcode very fast and then design it so that this microcode could implement list very fast. And you could make a computer that was about the, in the same price range as other computers that weren't meant for LISP, except it would run LISP much faster than they would, and with full type checking in every operation as well. Ordinary computers typically force you to choose between good execution speed and proper type checking. So yes, you can have a LISP compiler, you can run your programs fast, but when they try to operate to the power of a number, it works. It just gives 
nonsensical results, and you get a crash at some point later. On the Lisp machine, it was able to run about executing instructions about as fast as those other machines. But each instruction, say like the car instruction, would do data type checking. So when you tried to pick car or number, even in, in a compiled program, it would give you an immediate error. Well, the Lisp machine got working. We had a Lisp operating system for it, which was almost entirely written in Lisp, except the only exceptions being parts written in the microcode. And people became, became interested in manufacturing them, which meant they figured starting a company. But there were two different ideas about what this company should be like. Greenblatt wanted to start what he called a hacker company, which meant a company run by hackers that would operate in a way conducive to hackers. And another goal was not to destroy the hacker culture at the artificial intelligence lab. But Greenblatt didn't have any business experience, so other people in the Lisp machine group said that they doubted whether he could really do this. They thought that his plan to avoid outside investment wouldn't work. Why did he want to avoid outside investment? Because when your company has outside investors, they take control, and they won't let you have any scruples. And eventually, if you have any scruples, they'll replace you as the manager also. So he had the idea that he would find a customer who would pay in advance to buy the parts. They would build the machines, deliver them, and with the profits from those parts, they'd buy parts for a few more machines. And they'd sell them, and then they could buy parts for a larger number of machines, and so on. The other people in the group thought that this couldn't possibly work. So Greenblatt went to Russell Knopfler, the man who had hired me, and who had since left the AI lab and started another company that was successful. So he came back in. He was believed to have some more aptitude for business. And he demonstrated his aptitude for, for business by saying to the other people in the group, let's ditch Greenblatt and forget his ideas and we'll make another company. So stabbing in the back, clearly a real businessman. <clears throat> so those people decided they would form a company which they called Symbolis. And they would get outside investment and they would not have scruples and they would do everything possible to win. But Greenblatt didn't give up. He and the few people loyal to him decided to start their list machines incorporated anyway and go ahead with their plans. And what do you know? They succeeded. They got the first customer and they were paid in advance. They built machines, they sold them, they built more machines, they built more machines. LMI actually succeeded, even though it didn't have the help of most of the people in the group. And Symbolics, of course, also got off to a success. So there were two competing list machine companies. When Symbolics saw that LMI was not simply going to fall flat on its face, they started looking for a way to destroy it. And so, <clears throat> the abandonment of our lab was followed by war in our lab. The abandonment happened when Symbolics hired away all the hackers, except me and the people who had got some LMI part time. And then they found a rule they could invoke that those people couldn't remain part time working for MIT. They had to leave. Hiring. It was an MIT rule that they invoked to chase them away. So the AI lab had no hackers left except me. And then they figured the AI lab is helpless now. We can we can launch our main strike. Because MIT had made a very foolish arrangement with these two companies. It said that both of them it was a contract, a three-way contract, where both companies had licensed the use of the Lisp machine system sources. And these companies 
were supposed to let MIT use their changes, but it didn't say in the contract that MIT was entitled to put them into the MIT list machine system, which the both companies had licensed. Nobody had envisioned that the AI Labs hacker, hacker group would be wiped out the way it was. So at Symbolics, they, they came up with a plan. They said to the lab, we will continue making our changes to the system available for you to use, but you can't put it into the MIT list machine system. Instead, we'll give you access to the Symbolics list machine system, and you can run it, but that's all you can do with it. Which, in effect, meant that they were demanding that each one of us choose a side. We had to choose whether we would use the MIT version of the system or the Symbolics version. And whichever choice we made, that would determine what our improvements went to. If we worked on and improved the Symbolics version of the system, we'd be supporting Symbolics alone. If we used and improved the MIT version of the system, then we would be doing work available to both companies. But if Symbolics saw it, that meant we would be supporting LMI because we would be helping them continue to exist. So we were not allowed to be neutral anymore. Up until that point, I didn't take the side of either company. I was just miserable to see what had happened to my community. But once they demanded I take the side, I had no choice, really. I had to fight against them. That's what you do when you're in neutral and you're attacked. So I began duplicating all of the improvements that they made to the list machine system. I had to write the same improvements again myself. And after a while, I came to the conclusion it was best if I did this without even looking at their code. So when they made a beta announcement that gave the release notes, I would see what the features were and I would implement them. And by the time they had a real release, I would too. And in this way, for two years, I prevented them from wiping out this machine incorporated. And so the two companies went on, but I didn't want to spend years and years and years just punishing somebody, just warning and evil deed. I figured they'd been punished pretty thoroughly because they were stuck in competition that was not immediately going to go to disappear. And meanwhile, it was time to start building a new community to, re to replace the one that their actions and other unfortunate acts were wiped out. The, the community in the 70s was not limited to the MIT AI lab, and the hackers in the community were not all at MIT. This, the, the war that Symbolics started was what wiped it out at MIT, but there were various events happening then, people giving up on cooperation, that together, pretty much wiped out the community. There was nothing left. So when I stopped punishing Symbolics, the question is what I would do. I had to make a free operating system. That was clear. The only way people could work together and share was with a free operating system. At first, I thought of making a list-based operating system. <coughs> but I realized that wouldn't be a good idea technically. To have something like the list machine system you needed special purpose microcode. And that's what made it possible to run programs as fast as other, program, as other computers could run their programs and still get the benefit of the type checking. Without that, you'd be reduced to something like the list compilers we have for other machines. You could make the programs faster, but they're not safe anymore. Now, that's OK if you're running one program on top of a time sharing system. If that one program crashes, that's not a disaster. It's just something your program occasionally does. But that didn't make it good <coughs> for writing the operating system in. <coughs> so I rejected the idea of making a system like the list machine and decided instead to make a Unix-like operating system. And I figured we would have list implementations to run as user programs 
and it wouldn't be the, the kernel wouldn't be written in list. It wouldn't be a just a list environment, but we have list. <clears throat> and so the development of that operating system, the GNU operating system, is what led me to writing GNU Emacs. That was the next time I did work with Lisp after leaving MIT and not working on Lisp machines anymore. <coughs> In doing this, I aimed to make the absolute minimal possible Lisp implementation. See, size of the program was a tremendous concern. There were people in those days, in 1985, who had one meg machines without virtual memory. They wanted to be able to use GNU Emacs. And this meant I had to keep the program as small as possible. So at the time, for instance, the only looping construct was while, which was extremely simple. And if you wanted any kind of, there was no way to, to break out of the while statement. You just had to do a catch and a throw. Or else test the variable each time around the loop. So that, that shows how far I was pushing to keep things small. We didn't have Ka'ar and Katter and so on. There were just Ka'ar and Kutter and <coughs> more than one of them, you'd write more than one of them. Again, squeeze out everything possible was the spirit of the new Emacs at the beginning, the spirit of Emacs list. Now, obviously, machines are bigger now. We don't, we don't do it that way anymore. We put in car, car, and catter, and so on. And uh, we might put in another looping construct one of these days. There are, you know, we're willing to extend it some now, but we don't want to extend it to the level of common list. I implemented common list once on the list machine, and. Uh, I'm not all that happy with it. One thing that I don't like terribly much is keyword arguments. I mean, of course I can see why they're interesting, but they don't seem quite lispy to me. You know? So I prefer to, yeah, I'll do it sometimes, but I prefer to minimize the times when I do that. <clears throat> Later on, that was not the end of the new project's involvement with LISP. Later on, around 1995, we were <coughs> looking into starting a, a, a graphical desktop project. And it was clear that for programs in a graphical desktop, you want to have a LISP, you want to have a programming language to write a lot of it in, to make it easily accessible, like the editor. And the question is what it should be. At the time, TCL was being pushed heavily for this purpose. And I had a very low opinion of TCL, uh, basically because it wasn't list. It looks a tiny bit like this, but semantically it isn't. And it's nowhere near as clean. And then someone showed me an ad where Sun was trying to hire somebody to work on TCL to make it the de facto standard extension language of the world. And I thought, we've got to stop that from happening. <laughs> so we, start, we started to make C, the standard extensibility package language of GNU, not commonless because it was too large. The idea was then that we would recommend that if we would have a scheme interpreter designed to be linked into applications the same way TCL was designed to be linked into applications. And we would then recommend that as the extensibility package for all new programs. And there's a, an interesting benefit that you can get by using such a powerful language as a version of Lisp as your primary extensibility language. You can implement other languages by translating them into your primary language. If your primary language is TCL, you can't very easily implement LISP by translating it into TCL. But if your primary language is LISP, it's not that hard to implement other things by translating them. 
So our idea was that if each application that's extensible supports Scheme, you can write an implementation of TCL or Python or Perl or whatever it is you might like in Scheme that translates the programs into Scheme. And then you can load that into any application and, and customize it in your favorite language. And it will work together with other people's customizations as well. As long as the extensibility languages are weak, pitiful, then the users have to use only the language that you provided them. Which means that people who love any given language have to try to compete for the choice of the developers of applications. They have to say, please, application developer, put my language into your application, not his language. And then the users get no choice at all. Whichever application they're using comes with one language and they're stuck with it. <clears throat> but when you have a powerful enough language that you can implement others by translation into it, then you can give the user the choice of language. We don't have to have a language war anymore. And that's what I'm still hoping Guile, which is the name of our scheme interpreter, can do. We had a person working last summer uh, finishing up a translator from Python into Scheme. I don't know if it's entirely finished yet, but anyone who's interested in this project, please get in touch. So that's, that's the, the plan we have for the future. Now, I haven't been speaking about free software, but let me briefly tell you what free software <coughs> means. Free software does not refer to price. It doesn't mean that you get it for free. It means that you have freedom as a user. You may have paid for a copy, because it's legitimate to sell copies, or you may have got a copy gratis, but the crucial thing is that you are free to run the program, free to study what it does, free to change it to suit your needs, free to redistribute copies to others, free to publish improved and extended versions. This is what free software means. And if you're using a non-free program, then you have lost crucial freedom. So don't ever do that. The purpose of the GNU project is to make it easier for people to reject freedom trampling, user-dominated, non-free software by providing free software to replace it with. For those who don't have enough moral courage to reject the non-free software when that needs some practical inconvenience, well, we try to give them a free alternative so that they can move to freedom with less and less and less sacrifice in practical terms. The less sacrifice, the better. We want to make it easy for you to live a life of freedom to cooperate. And it is a matter of freedom to cooperate. We're used to thinking of freedom and cooperation with society as if they were opposites. But here, they're on the same side. With free software, you are free to cooperate with other people as well as free to help yourself. With non-free software, somebody is dominating you and keeping people divided. They say, you're not allowed to share with them. So you're not free to cooperate. You're not free to help society any more than you're free to help yourself. Divided and helpless is the state of users using non-free software. We've produced a tremendous range of free software. We've done what people said we could never do. We have two entire operating systems of free software. And we have many applications. We obviously have a lot farther to go. So we need your help. And I'd like to ask you to please volunteer for the new project. Help us develop free software for more jobs. Take a look at www.gnu.org slash help is where you can find suggestions for how to help. If you want to order things, well, there's a link to that in the home page. And if you want to read about philosophical issues, look at slash philosophy. If you're looking for free software to use, look at slash directory or slash software, either one. You'll get to the same directory, which lists about 1,900 packages now which is only a fraction of all the free software out there, but I hope it's the, mostly the best of the packages. <clears throat> and please write more and contribute to us. My book of essays, Free Software, Free Society, is on sale outside. 
and if you get the beer, I can sign it for you. So happy happy. I think I'm less than a minute over time. And I found something to talk about. <laughs>